Okay, so now we're recording. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Before we start, I just want to show our event calendar for this month. The first one is the one that you're currently looking at. And then we have two live events and at least one of them is gonna have free pizza, but I'm sure that nobody's gonna come just for the free pizza. So can't wait to see you there. Um, today with uh, Leo David Moritz uh, from Kern AI. We're going to talk about data, labeling, and models. Um, mm, yeah. Yes. Data is super important. And if you're not Google, Apple, or uh, Meta, and you don't have access to copious amounts of uh, super high quality labeled data, it's kind of hard to start. So this is what we're going to talk about today. And so, yes. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being so active in our community. And uh, yeah, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I will quickly share my screen. So, does this work for everyone? Yes, yeah. looks good. Yes. Okay, perfectly. So, thanks for the quick introduction. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, I think I can speak for all of us uh, to say that it's a meaningful uh, community, even if we're not in Munich. Um, it's just something that uh, brings like, like 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 yeah people together that are uh, NLP interested, NLP focused, and I think it's just a very meaningful um, discussion, even um, for the memes and for the paper discussions. Really fun, and thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Moritz. Today, I brought Diff and Leo with me from, we're all working at Kern AI. And today we're gonna talk about modern labeling techniques to overcome the cold start problem. So what we want to achieve today is get a new perspective on labeling that is not just um, handed over to crowd labelers who are uh, drastically underpaid, but a little more um, diverse and rich. So this is our team on the left. It's not really an up-to-date picture, but just to get a sense, I think it was uh, in the summer 2021. And on the right side, you can see our main product basically, uh, which is called Refinery. And it is an open source IDE for NLP. Um, this is how we basically frame it. It's where you can, um, yeah, just upload your data. You can label your data both manually and programmatically, which we are going to come to in a second. You can monitor your label quality and your data quality. You can explore your data and much more. Um, it's open source. You can check it out on GitHub. You can, it's, it's free to use basically. You can just um, clone the repository. It's all dockerized. So it's really, really easy to start also. No really the installation is um, straightforward, can also be done with PIP, by the way. And today we want to talk about the cold start problem. What is the cold start problem is the question that we first have to answer. This is basically the cold start starter pack. So the cold start problem is something that we phrase as you have your use case already in mind. So you know you want to use machine learning or deep learning to achieve some natural language processing task. Do you want to automate something? Um, the problem is that you have either very little labeled data or a bunch of raw data um, that you need labeled for your specific use case. For example, classification, you want to train a ca custom classifier, for example, for classifying emails. Um, it's just um, a toy example, but you lack the data, the labeled data. Oftentimes, there's also pressure from stakeholders. So there's not only um, pressure from like real stakeholders, like, uh, for example, uh, people who are invested in your company, or, but also from maybe yourself, because you have very <laughs> limited free time and you don't want to mess around uh, with manual labeling all the time, uh, or just also pressure from in, in the real company uh, where you rely on labeled data to automate something. The problem is that oftentimes the stakeholders or you even yourself uh, underestimate how expensive it is to actually label data. 
Um, and oftentimes you're on a small budget because when you're also developing or researching, um, then you cannot yeah, spend that much money on something that in the end might not even uh, work or might not be as valuable as you thought. The problem is this now leaves you with no idea how to start. This is what we call the cold start problem. And today we want to tackle that problem. So there will be three main points today. So the first, um, how to start from scratch, assuming that you have no labeled data or very little labeled data, but you have raw data already collected that you want to have labeled. The second part is gonna be um, done by Div, and he's gonna talk about improving the already labeled data quality. So assuming you have a bunch of labeled data, um, as we will see, labeled data is not always clean, so you have to refine uh, that data um, to achieve higher data quality. And last but not least, Leo will talk about some experimental approaches that we also played around with um, at Kern AI for different use cases. So let's start starting from scratch. The problem statement is pretty clear. You have some unlabeled data collected and you want that data to be machine learning ready labeled. The problem is that there's this daunting thing in the middle that is oftentimes uh, manual labeling, which is really costly. It is time consuming. It is inefficient um, because more often than not, you're labeling duplicates and stuff like that. So you really want to get rid of this. Ideally, uh, you would get rid of it completely, but that is not really possible. There will always be manual labeling, um, but we can actually leverage some modern techniques that go way beyond this. And today um, in the section from scratch, we're gonna talk about heuristics and we're gonna talk about weak supervision as parts of this modern labeling stack. So at first, because maybe not everyone is familiar with the concept of heuristics in this framing, um, what we want to achieve with heuristics is we want to transfer knowledge to the system, basically. So what we can see here is a sentence, 12 celebrities that you must know in 2023 which is basically a headline, can be understood as a news headline, for example, or something you will just scroll by. And when you manually label this data, you yourself have a mental, a mental model um, of why this is, for example, classified as clickbait and not as regular news. And this mental model, for example, might be that, yeah, you see um, some structural uh, um, observation. So this starts with a number, right? Then you see that this headline addresses you as a reader, um, which is not really the case for most of the news headlines. So you think, okay, it addresses the reader. So this might be clickbait. This is what we call heuristics. So you see that there's either some content or some, uh, some structure to the data that you could express um, explicitly um, to help you labeling basically, because these are the decisions that made you label it as clickbait manually. So we can express these concepts basically as code, as Python code, for example, and these are then called labeling functions. And they don't have to be perfect. For example, starting with a number could also be a news headline about something that happened this year, for example, 2023 is the year of something, something. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be a heuristic. Um, and these are inherently um, not perfect. And this is what we call explicit heuristics because you are explicitly stating your knowledge. You're explicitly coding this knowledge um, into the system. Also sometimes referred to as expert systems, for example. There's also the notion of implicit heuristics. So um, this is just terms that we are now discussing to um, make it more um, yeah, understandable. Basically, there are, there's much more in the literature, but here, for example, what we can also do is we can 
use this headline embedded with a state-of-the-art transformer model, uh, some sentence bird or whatever, um, and use our manually labeled reference data, which doesn't have to be a lot. For example, just 50 labels of every class or 50 examples of every class. We can feed these sentences and this data to an active learner who leverages the power of the pre-trained models um, to help you in actually labeling. So making predictions with this active learner is also a valid heuristic. And this is just simple transfer learning as we know it. And we call this implicit because you're not, even though you're providing the manual labels, you're not really explicitly stating anything. You're just fitting the model and using it for predictions. Here, for example, we want to classify some sentiment. If something is good or bad, you can see that we can uh, explicitly write just code. For example, if a bad word is uh, in our record, then we return bad. Or if some good word is in it, we return good. Um, this is also how we basically use it in refinery. Um, this bad word, good word is exploiting content. Um, and as we've seen before, you could also exploit structure. What's really nice is uh, that you don't rely on just basically the standard functions that Python gives you. You can also use outside APIs or outside toolkits to en enhance basically your records and enhance and enrich your records um, so that you can have much, much more complex labeling functions with not that much code. For example, here, the original text was just, hi, I am John. And we're using Bricks, which is also an open source uh, collection of common uh, NLP tasks that we created at Kern AI. You can also check it out on GitHub. And you can now use pre-built Bricks, as we call them, to enrich your record for easier labeling, for example. So here we have a translator that translates it to German, Hallo, ich bin John. Then we add some sentence complexity calculations here in this case, it's very low. Um, and what you can also do is what's really great is use zero shot classification here in this case with GPT-3 and yeah, just use this as a tool to enrich your data basically. Now, if we want to now label our data and don't want to um, purely rely, for example, on zero shot because zero shot is always a little bit um, yeah, experimental. We're going to come to that later on. Uh, you can basically now split your data into the low complexity ones and route those to a labeling function. For example, you can say, if my complexity is very low or low, then I will just use the uh, zero shot classification label. And if the complexity is really high, then, well, I must label the data myself because I am the domain matter expert and really complex data cannot be simply routed um, to an easy labeling function or to an easy heuristic um, oftentimes. Just to see, uh, just to show you how easy that actually is, uh, we have, we just have to head over to bricks.kernai. And um, the cool thing about it is that, of course, we're also, as you can see here on GitHub, completely open source. So feel free to use it, feel free to contribute, feel free to enhance it, uh, fork it, anything you want. Um, you can basically go into the classifiers. For example, here, let's go into uh, emotionality detection. Then here you see the code that you can use either uh, standalone or use it directly into refi in refinery because this was um, initially also built as yeah, um, a tool to enhance refinery basically, and then we made it standalone. So everybody can just use it for their use cases. And the cool thing about it is you not only see the direct code that was used um, for these bricks, but you can also see then of course the imports. So maybe get a good feeling of what is useful and what is not. And on the top right, we even have um, an example input field where you can just run the samples. So input something that you want, run the sample, and then you get the endpoint response. So you can even, even test it directly in the UI. You don't even have to um, manually copy the code or something like that. 
really cool tool. Um, and yeah, as I said, feel free to contribute also because this is uh, yeah a group effort. So we now looked at the explicit um, heuristics. So the most we looked at labeling functions, but there's also as I teased the implicit um, heuristics that help you with labeling. And the most prominent one is active learning. The goal of active learning is to pick the most informative samples. So basically what you don't want is waste your precious manual labeling on um, things like duplicates or really um, easy and low complex uh, samples because your manual labeling is really, really yeah, expensive. So you wouldn't want it to go to waste. What you do with active learning, this is the traditional active learning loop, is you would, for example, have a labeled data set, which is really small. You would start, for example, with 50 labeled samples. You would train a classifier on it, which is here logistic regression, for example. And then you make predictions on some unlabeled data. This doesn't have to be the whole data because oftentimes you have a lot of uh, data lying around, you could also randomly sample, for example, 100 records, make predictions on that. And based on those predictions, query, basically, um, they can choose an algorithm to query uh, the user to label something. So here, for example, we use uncertainty sampling, which is one of the most intuitive ones. Um, but there are many other query selection strategies. So uncertainty sampling would be you would order your predictions by confidence, and you would um, then let the user label these records where the model is the least confident on. Because you expect that if the model is the least confident on something, that it would contribute the most um, actually to the, the labeled data set. So they are the most informative samples. We in Refinery um, took a little a different approach basically because this traditional active learning sees the user in a kind of passive role i would say because you are the oracle basically that is queried by the algorithm um, but as refinery is a developer tool we wanted to put yeah the developer into focus so as you would use it in refinery you would first manually label some reference data because you can honestly never go without manually labeling some data, um, not only for all of these technologies, but also to just get a feel of your data. It is really important to manually label it to also estimate data quality and so on. Then you would use these manual labels to fit a model, make some predictions, and these predictions then you can validate. So you can just randomly sample uh, some predictions that this active learner made. You can validate them or even invalidate them if they were wrong. But still, every manual label that you contribute helps this kind of active learning cycle because then you can retrain it and re-predict and revalidate and so on and so forth. So we've now looked at heuristics, both explicit and implicit. But if you remember correctly, uh, from the labeling functions and the same goes for active learners. They don't have to be perfect. They are just heuristics. Because now we have a bunch of heuristics on our data that we can all aggregate into a single label. And this is going to be done by weak supervision. So we looked at manual labeling. We looked at the heuristics. Now the last part of the puzzle is weak supervision. Here we have some dots. These dots represent data. So every dot is a record that you have uh, either manually labeled or not. The manually labeled ones are colorful. This is um, a sentiment analysis use case where you have good, neutral, and bad. Now, if you introduce labeling function to the mix, it has some coverage. So it makes predictions for a certain subset of your data. You can then add more heuristics. For example, here's an active learner. Here are some heuristics for if, uh, these other classes. And now in this landscape, you have some statistics that you can use. 
So as I said, there's the coverage. So what is my heuristic actually hitting? What data and how much of it? Then we have some overlaps. So between two different heuristics that are um, making the predictions for the same class, these are called overlaps because they agree. Uh, if they disagree, for example, so here we have a heuristic for neutral, here we have a heuristic for bad, this is called a conflict. And one of the most crucial tools is actually estimating precision. And this is also because you have your manually labeled reference data, which is already colored here. So this you can use for precision estimation and the green uh, heuristic right here would have a precision estimated of 66%, for example. And then you can use all this information, even more information. You could even, there are many, many, many algorithms of weak supervision that you can actually use. There's a lot of research in that direction. The most straightforward one would be um, a weighted majority vote, where you would weight, for example, by the precision um, of your heuristic. So this heuristic, this green one, the vote of it would go in with 66%, for example. Yeah, and then you can use these statistics and just calculate basically the labels. Of course, this, will, this is now a, <laughs> a really small toy example. Uh, in reality, this is really, really complex. Like there are um, these labeling functions. I have many, many overlaps. They have many, many also disagreements. So they have many conflicts and so on. But in general, um, this is how it would work visualized. And of course, it wouldn't be um, so nicely displayed. Uh, in the end, you would literally just have a table with predictions and these records. So heuristic one, for example, either predicts news or predicts nothing. Heuristic two, either politics or nothing. There are some heuristics who can predict um, multiple labels, but usually um, they predict a single one. And then in the end, what you get after the information integration, after the weak supervision uh, algorithm was executed on these heuristics, you get a probability label out of it, which is really great and works actually really well. And this is an iterative approach. So more often than not, you will not do this a single time because then you label some more data, you, ex you explore some more patterns, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of a circle, um, and which is also what we call that refinery because you're constantly refining your data. Weak supervision is actually really, really interesting. There's a lot of research on it. Um, I would suggest the first thing to do when you want to read more on it would be to go on this um, awesome list, awesome weak supervision on GitHub. Um, there's basically all the other Ref, uh, references that I have on the slide are also uh, in this awesome weak supervision repository. And uh, yeah, very recently, 2022 was the survey, a survey on programmatic weak supervision, which also really interesting and comprehensive. So I can just, uh, if this is something that you're interested in, um, go ahead and read it. This was it from my side. I will now hand it over to Diff. Um, who will talk about improving the labeled data quality when you already have some labels. Thank you, Moritz. Um, hi, everyone. And um, in this talk, yeah, I will mainly talk about the challenges which are faced when dealing with the training data and how to overcome those challenges, basically. And um, this part will consist of mostly about confident learning and also uh, inter annotator agreement. So uh, yeah, let's begin with it. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so yeah, over time, uh, it has been very evident that in almost all cases, your training data will be messy. The very starting point of improving, therefore, your data label quality uh, quality is to clean the training data, and. Uh, for example, on the slide, you can see some of the data sets, some of the most popular data sets, which have been given incorrect labels, but uh, the machine learning models, they have uh, corrected them. And um, yeah, basically it will be uh, about one of the tricks that we use um, for 
detecting errors in ground truths, which is called confident learning. Now, confident learning is basically a data-centric approach, which focuses instead on uh, label quality by characterizing and identifying label errors in data sets based on um, the principles of crooning uh, the noisy data and counting with uh, some probabilistic thresholds to estimate noise, um, and also ranking examples to train with confidence. Now, in this scenario, you can see there is some noisy label which might be induced by uh, human labeling. So uh, as an example, there is uh, some uh, record which was um, labeled as news, but the model prediction suggested that it should rather be sports. And uh, for that, it is very crucial that we uh, introspect on uh, how we have labeled the data, uh, because we assume that the manual labeling is the ground truth. And if we have errors in that, then it can uh, lead to errors in the predictions by the model. And we would not know, okay, which one to trust, which one not to. So uh, the discrepancy basically can be uh, visualized using a confusion matrix in which the diagonal elements represent agreement between labels and the off diagonal elements represent the disparity between. On the, um, the vertical um, labels that you see, they are the predicted labels that are suggested by the model. And uh, the horizontal ones, they are um, showing the manually labeled um, manual labels, sorry. Um, and as you can see that uh, you have some uh, scores that signify on this confusion matrix and you can uh, see, okay, uh, by counting all of the sum total of the errors, we have almost 25% of error factor, which is quite huge and we cannot just ignore it. Um, it would be, it would lead to a lot of uh, confusion uh, if we ignore that. And uh, so when we talk about confident learning, we, uh, there are some steps that need to be taken when we are uh, implementing it. So it's basically uh, to use the model to make predictions on the entire data set, then compute the uncertainty estimates for each prediction. Now there are several methods that we can use to estimate this uncertainty. Could be you can use Monte Carlo sampling or Bayesian inference, etc. Uh, and then what we do is that we want to sort the predictions in ascending order based on their uncertainty estimates. So in the example that we were looking at, uh, we had 25% of errors, and then we can take the first 25% as potential labeling errors in our data, uh, in our data, and. Uh, What we want to do with that is then manually label a subset of the predictions that we that lie within this error margin and uh, we want to relabel them with the highest accuracy to our knowledge basically and when it is done then we want to retrain the model on the label subset and uh, we we can keep doing that until the model's performance stabilizes this is one of the things that uh, we can do to uh, avoid uncertainty in the manual labeling of the data. And also there can be um, other tricks, one of which I have highlighted as well called the uh, inter annotator agreement. And uh, what we basically in, do in this, it's also, uh, as you can see on the slide, represented as a confusion matrix and um, we have a few annotators, for example, Moritz is there uh, on the picture you can see. And um, let's say that um, Moritz and I, we are two annotators and we are uh, labeling the same data and uh, the same records. And I uh, label some of the records differently than what Moritz has labeled. And it will be represented on this matrix and we can have a better clarity of, uh, okay, there is a disagreement between Moritz and I um, and I think uh, uh, the accuracy can be higher than 85, 87.5%, uh, but uh, we can discuss that later on. And then, okay, this is the kind of label that we can set for it. Um, and that's how we can actually increase the, uh, uh, the data label quality uh, of the manual labels and then uh, let the model do their work to the best of their accuracy. 
So uh, I was mostly highlighting these two uh, techniques that we can do to avoid uh, any potential errors from the uh, manual labeling side in the uh, model. And also uh, we use the inter annotator agreement in refinery. So uh, yeah, you can go check it out as well. And uh, I, from this, I will hand it over to Leo who will talk about some of the more experimental approaches. Very cool. Thank you, Div. Hi folks. I'm Leo, and uh, today I'm going to talk about a few experimental things. So things that might be useful for your machine learning projects, but things that you shouldn't solely rely on. Okay, let's dive right in. So first off, I would like to talk about um, something called zero-shot labeling. And um, in a nutshell, zero-shot labeling is using large language models to very quickly and easily get cheap labels for our data. Um, those labels will be, of course, noisy a lot of the times, but that's okay because, I don't know, they're cheap. We can get them very quickly. And um, we can do this because large language models contain a lot of very useful information that we can also um, leverage for our machine learning projects. And in general, you can say that the more parameters a um, language model has, the fewer um, task-specific data we need to provide in order to get accurate labels for our data. So how would this, um, how would this look like then? Let's say we have some, uh, some data, for example, news headlines um, like this one here, Apple announces a new MacBook Pro at the CES 2023. We would then put that into, oops, sorry, I just spilled some water. We would then um, put this into a large language model and we would also um, provide a set of potential um, labels for our data. So in this case, um, for example, the category of the news articles like business, arts and, uh, arts and culture, technology or politics. And uh, yeah, in this case, hopefully um, the model would then return the cor correct label. In this case, um, the technology category. Oh, and by the way, um, there's a really cool paper about um, how we can use, for example, GPT-3 to reduce our labeling cost. Um, I have linked it down below. We can also send out the slides um, afterwards if you're interested in, uh, in getting that. Um, keep in mind the paper is written by Microsoft, so it's maybe a little bit biased, but it's still a good read nonetheless. And so um, you have to keep in mind uh, when zero shot is good to use and when you should maybe not use this rather experimental approach. So zero shot labeling could be really great if you don't really need extremely accurate results and if you don't need a um, machine learning model that is super, super robust. Also, zero shot is really cool if your classes are not too ambiguous. If you have a data set where a human annotator has a really hard time assigning labels, chances are that a large language model will struggle here as well, if not even more than a human also, um, you can use zero shot if you don't expect a large domain gap between the data that the model was trained on and the data that you have on your hand. So that means um, if you have a la large disparity between models that, it, uh, if you have a large disparity between the data that a model was trained on and your data, you should not use zero shot. If you have very niche data, company specific data or data, for example, from a um, knowledge base that is not public, um, you should not expect to um, have a zero-shot approach that works really well for you. Also, um, you should never only use zero-shot to get labels, um, but it's really nice if you combine it with other label sources, like, um, of course, always manual labels, at least some of them, or labeling functions, um, the heuristics that, that Moritz basically talked about. Cool. Okay, let's um, very quickly take a look at how we can um, very easily in a few lines of code um, implement zero-shot labeling ourselves. So what we need is a pre-trained transformer model. I really like to use 
um, a sentence bird from DeepSet for this, and you can then um, load in this model both as the tokenizer and uh, as well as the model itself. You then provide your sentences. Um, in this case, again, our sentence, uh, Apple announces a new MacBook Pro at CES 2023. And then we also, again, provide our labels, business, arts and culture, politics, technology, and so on. Next, we would then batch encode um, both our sentence as well as our labels. We would then retrieve the input IDs as well as the attention mask from the inputs and then pass that to our model. And after that, we get a vectorized representation of both our sentences as well as our labels. And if we have a vectorized representation, we can then use something like the cosine similarity to actually get the closest label to our original sentence. And in this case, the model actually said, yeah, this sentence is actually of the category technology. So yeah, it worked here. You don't have to do it like this. You can also use a simple pipeline from Hugging Face, for example, but I just quickly wanted to um, print this out in code to give you a little bit of a better understanding of how this actually works. Okay, enough about zero shot for now. Um, let's maybe talk about something um, else that might be really cool for your machine learning pro um, project, which is um, similarity learning. We talked a lot about labeling and how you can improve your labels, but um, there's also a method which allows you to fine tune the data and the vectors of your um, embedded um, text data sets um, directly. And it's a really cool thing that we would like to, to show you now. So if you're familiar with um, modern NLP techniques, you know that we cannot use um, text data right out of the box. We need to um, convert our raw text data into a numeric representation. And uh, that's called text embedding. And when we do text embedding, what we get out is usually a whole bunch of um, vectors. And we can then feed these vectors into a, a machine learning model, for example. And together with these vectors, we can then label these. And with the labels and our vectorized data, we can then, of course, build a um, machine learning model. For example, for classification, we can use something like a decision tree, which then divides up our vector space to get new predictions. Nothing too wild here, I would say. But what if our vectorized data is kind of messy or if it's poorly structured? What can we do then? Well, I mean, of course, we can build a more complex algorithm to then fit that data, but that would be computationally expensive and it would maybe also lead to very poor results in the end. It would maybe have very bad accuracy and uh, it would also probably be not easy to maintain. So instead of finding an algorithm that somehow fits that messy data, what we can actually do with similarity learning is we can improve our vector space itself. So we can not only improve our labels with things like confident learning, but we can also use similarity learning to directly improve the um, vector space that we have so that the downstream task um, at hand becomes much more easier. Um, okay, so if this sounds great, there are thing, uh, still a few things you should um, keep in mind when doing something like similarity learning. So similarity learning is really, really great if you have um, a lot of difficulties defining class boundaries. Um, that is often the case if you have really, really um, a lot of classes in your data set um, or, and, uh, or if you have like hierarchical classes, subclasses, um, then things can get messy really, really quick. And that's actually um, where things like similarity learning can be really, really helpful for you. And so here at Kern, we actually did some testing ourselves. Um, we took a look at the AG News data set and um, compared the raw data set with the um, fine-tuned data set. 
And what we did, we um, closely observed the um, distances between the vectorized texts. And as you can see, the um, structure of the data set actually changed quite a bit. So uh, we can definitely say that um, similarity learning did something to our data. What we also observed is um, that the fine tuning had very little to no influence on very simple classification models. So if you just have a very simple task at hand, um, you don't really need to do similarity learning. However, if you have um, things like, or if you want to do things like semantic search, if you want to build a information retrieval system, recommendation system, or matching um, engine, or if you want to do classification with really a lot of classes, then similarity learning might be really, really cool for you. Um, again, you can uh, find the link where we um, did the testing down below if you're interested in diving deeper into this. And um, I also provided a link for more potential use cases if you're interested in more. Before we finish up, let's maybe take a quick look at how we can do something like similarity learning because it's actually very, very easy. We like to do um, similarity learning with a free and open source library called Quaterion. You can simply check it out on GitHub. And after you install it, we simply um, import all the libraries that we need from Quaterion. Then we also um, simply provide a um, class with a translation dictionary um, containing all of our labels. And then we simply pass that to Quaterion, um, which then handles all of the fine tuning for us. So it's no rocket science, um, very easy. And if you have, again, for example, a classification task with a lot of um, classes, then this might be very useful for you. Phew, okay. Quite a lot of uh, input, but um, yeah, we hope that we could give you, uh, give you some really cool new perspectives on label data and how to get started um, when you have very little data or what you can do to then improve your data, improve your labels. Um, yeah, Moritz in the beginning um, showed you some really cool things on um, how you can build heuristics and why of course manual labeling is still important. Um, what you can do with weak supervision or how you can leverage machine learning models um, with active learning in your labeling process. If then told you a little bit about confident learning and how you can use this really cool technique to easily spot errors in your labeling and also what you can do if you are many people and um, how you can then use the inter annotator agreement um, uh, inter annotator agreement to then easily um, improve your labeling and in the last pa uh, part I just uh, told you a little bit about zero shot labeling and what you can do with similarity labeling uh, similarity learning, sorry. Cool. Um, we also published our own research about some of these techniques and um, how we implemented these technologies um, in our tool refinery. And if you're interested in that, we are very happy to send that out um, to you as well. And yeah, also um, feel free to check out um, our tool on GitHub. Again, it's free, it's open source. You can check it out on uh, code minus kern minus AI slash refinery. You can also try out our online playground at demo.kern.ai. Um, yeah, it's a uh, labeling environment where you can use a lot of these cool um, techniques we just uh, showed you. And uh, yeah, that's it from us. Thank you very much for having us. And we really hope that you enjoyed this. Thanks so much. This was very interesting. Um, I hope people have some questions and what well, they're thinking. I yes, I already like see some questions. Yeah, I also see Miriam uh, definitely has her hand raised directly. <laughs> oh, okay, so Miriam, you can just uh, go that, on and that, ask your that question. Was, that was a clap, but I also have a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks yeah. for the clap. But yeah, feel yeah. free to answer uh, to ask any questions you have. Um, yeah, first of all, again, thank you for uh, the interesting talk. And I apologize if this question is like really dumb, <laughs> but because I, I'm <laughs> not worry. I'm not in your field. But I was just wondering why you were explaining everything. I understood the workflow. Like, um, if I don't have much label data, then I can use your techniques or the techniques you presented to get more labels and then have a classifier who classifies everything. Why do I still need the classifier if I have a super labeler that can label everything and I trust the That's labels? A... 
<laughs> that's a very that's a very good that's a very good, very good question. Yeah, of course. I mean, you can also uh, use a a big transformer model out of the box and just use this for for your task. Um, but the downside of that is that um, large transformer models are um, often very big, and they are also like harder to deploy and more costly to deploy. And so, what you can do is you can actually um, profit from things like GPT uh, GPT three. Um, giving you very good labels, and then you can um, build a very small classifier out of that. This is very lightweight, and then it is easier to maintain and easier to upkeep. But if you don't care about money, of course, then you just can deploy a transformer model itself. But I wouldn't say that's that's very efficient. And yeah, Moritz, I think you have something to say about that as well. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, Miriam, if you're referring to uh, basically if weak supervision spits out a label, why not use weak supervision all the time? Why still need? Why why would you still need a model, right? For example, um, for the in the case of weak supervision, uh, it is also um, what really easily can be answered as weak supervision has to be run on your on the whole data with all heuristics um, every time. Basically, you cannot run a single inf inference uh, with weak supervision. So you would need all the statistics, all the heuristics basically that make predictions on your data um, to then come to a final conclusion, to a final label, to a final weak supervision label. And these active learners, so these small heuristics basically that are machine learning models that are helping you in labeling, um, you shouldn't use those standalone because they can be, um, yeah, they, they have to be integrated with other sources of information to really shine basically because then you would just use normal transfer learning for your application, um, but you would rather use this transfer learning as a heuristic to combine with your um, domain knowledge um, that is explicitly stated in labeling functions, for example. There are also many, many, many other heuristics, for example, knowledge bases, um, knowledge graphs, and so on that you can query that have really high precision, for example, that really shine in combination with these things. But to answer it short, um, you would then train a model on those labels um, first, so you can incorporate the actual manual labels that you set, um, like directly. And second, because you can run single inference and you have much more control uh, over your model. And as much more, you can use all the interpret uh, interpretability methods on the single model and so on, which would have a hard time on weak supervision. All right. To summarize, it's a matter of efficiency and interpretability and so on and so forth. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But, That's right. But if yeah, I definitely. really, really wanted to, I could just label everything with your approach. <laughs> that would I not guess be very you, smart. <laughs> I guess you could, but that would be really expensive. And um, maybe there are some things that I'm actually at the moment not aware of in terms of like information theory, where that this doesn't make sense. But I would, uh, my first argument would be efficiency reasons. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Martin, I think you have some questions as well, right? Yes. First of all, Miriam, actually a great question. So thank you. Uh, and also another question, if you have compared your labeling results with some official labels, for example, if you have something like Cifra 100, how close or maybe how even better how how close or even better are your labels compared to the official ones? Um, so, uh, with the the benchmarks that you mentioned at the moment, so we this refinery is only NLP basically. So um, we had, I guess, internal testing. We have some toy, like not toy, but we have some data sets that we are constantly looking at. For example, AG News is uh, one or Clickbait. And other than this, uh, we also go to industry partners, basically, where we deploy this technique, um, help to gather labels, and then they use um, trained models on top of th these labels, basically, to internally um, yeah, use, use this, basically. <clears throat> and there, the, like, I can't at the moment name concrete numbers, but uh, it performs mm. really competitive, especially if you use it in combination with a weak supervision confidence threshold of like 90%, um, then you, you're you not getting um, all the benefits of weak supervision because then you're, if you're taking a really high threshold, of course, you're not um, getting so much labeled data in the end, 
but still it outperforms um like it in terms of efficiency which is um in in in, in the industry really really important it outperforms the manual labeling thank you um i have maybe another question that is a little bit more of an esoteric question and it's very subjective so this is just um your opinion on what's the future of with all of these stuff that are coming right now like in the last year the world of ai and programming has just been completely changed and we see so many low code solutions or even no code solutions so i'm just thinking what do you think is is going to happen in like 10 years to to this kind of development developer jobs and software engineering and so on with all of these low code and no code solutions i'm just interested so maybe i can speak first leo diff you can you can then also talk about it uh so i for myself um yeah don't don't like to think too much about it <laughs> because <laughs> I also am like in this field. Uh, generally, um, I'm I'm I position myself more as an AI realist and not of a AI kind of optimist. I would say so. Um, I follow, for example, Gary Marcus on Twitter, which uh, has the most um, realist takes. I would say that with all this uh, large language model transformations, then um, people are still I think kind of overestimating their capabilities because we don't really know what's going on, which is also why I like the Shogoth meme so much uh, of this tentacle monster that is GPT-3. And then there's a little a small happy face on it um, made by reinforcement learning with human feedback because I think we don't really know uh, at the moment what is going on, but over the next 10 years, I think all predictions are wrong, basically. So uh, wrong in the sense. Right wrong in the sense you cannot predict it so who yeah. would have thought at the start of 2021 right um what would happen so with stable diffusion with all these large yeah. language models it was insane so leo maybe your take yeah i am quite sure that we have to brace ourselves for more change in the future but how exactly that change will look like i don't know nobody really knows at the moment um, but I would maybe say that I'm more an optimist, um, not a realist. So I think the future is going to be kind of okay. I don't think that things like ChatGPT will take all of our jobs or something like that. Um, I think these new technologies are really, really um, exciting. They are also, of course, terrifying in some sense, but um, I think they will close some doors and they will open uh, other doors. But yeah, in the end. Uh, I don't know as well. So yeah, Diff, maybe what's your, uh, what's your take on this? Uh, so yeah, basically um, I'm neither an AI optimist nor an AI realist. Um, I am AI myself. No, I'm kidding. Um, basically <laughs> it is just- An AI pessimist would be, would be fun. So it has <laughs> each of one. <laughs> uh, no, actually, uh, it's like, if you had asked me like, you know, uh, a few months ago, maybe a few months to a year ago, I would have probably been like, you know, freaked out by the advancements made by AI because yeah, I was, I had the same um, thought that, okay, it's going to replace a lot of jobs. It's going to uh, put people out of jobs um, maybe, but uh, like how the world is like, has slowly changed with the advancement of uh, uh, AI, uh, especially especially like since Chat GPT game and uh, all these uh, GPT GPT four, uh, like what they're still talking about, I think um, I I cannot comment upon well if there are going to be uh, like a lot of new job opportunities, but um, what I am pretty sure about is that people who are doing, let's say, software engineering or like uh, uh, normal data scientist coding and stuff, they might have to change their methodology, like, you know, how they're learning stuff, because that, that uh, would be a bit of uh, a drastic change with the AI, current AI technology. For example, like ChatGPT, you um, 
can it has proven like you can easily learn to code the code won't work in most cases what chat gpt will provide you with but uh you will learn like you know okay what the methodology behind that is so um as of now i don't see it will take away the jobs so it will just transform it a little bit that is my opinion so i think people who are in this field in computer science or technology uh, they just have to uh, maybe transform their methodology a little bit in order to adapt with these upcoming ai technologies and be up to date what is your take on this martin i really like this this answers i think it's i think it from one point point of view it has already transformed most of jobs because when i talk to people um, that work in for example the big four I mean, consulting even 10, 10 years ago was very non-IT based. And right now there is almost no consulting job that doesn't include some kind of, I mean, even if you're like a low level, like first level line of consulting, you have to know some JavaScript, for example, if you support some kind of a, a ticketing system or something like this. So it basically forces all jobs and all positions to be extra qualified right now. Uh, and everybody, and it's no longer it's no longer um, enough to just put proficient in Excel and uh, Word uh, in your CV. But um, yeah, it's definitely we need some realism, and yeah, it's a little bit. Some of the stuff are overhyped. So right now we don't have to worry, but maybe maybe in the in the future. Mm. I would say uh, let's let's see about AI when when Web three is big again. So. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of people con like coming from from the hype cycle of crypto and Web three that are now really pushing AI, which previously felt like a really research dominated field, and now with these um, accessibility by OpenAI, I think this was the first time where people suddenly felt like, oh, okay, this is now AI, and people really felt this is now AI, but this unfortunately comes with many many people overhyping it overstating it using it for clickbait stuff like that when when most of the people that are using it don't even know that large language models hallucinate like this is one of the most important things at the moment it just makes up stuff even code it imports libraries that don't exist and stuff like that so people are overhyping it without actually like realistically telling the non-domain experts um what the risks are or what the downsides are basically so this generates kind of this this hype cycle which i don't really like i i love the more research uh, focused approach like two years ago i guess one and a half years ago but yeah that's life also ai is basically as a used as a marketing label nowadays uh, so you just take a, an app uh, and for these apps there are already templates you just slap a few for loops and you'd call it ai which it is obviously not and it has nothing to do with ai um so this is uh, definitely a sin that has uh, done uh, very bad stuff to the ai community but i think if i on an optimistic side if um universities and academia gets their stuff together and because we were talking with um um, Asmacha, uh, he's a professor here at the LMU, and we were talking about how innovation was kind of taken away from academia and given to the um, to the industry. If we can balance this out, kind of, and also it's it was given to very big companies, and it would be really cool if we can balance this out. And um, also the emergence of smaller companies that do open source stuff and of offer their resources for free. Um, Turning AI, weights and biases, where you ha always have a free tier and you can actually use this stuff and it's not completely uh, proprietary. I think this does a lot of good uh, things to the community and people. Yes. Can I add on this? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm one of these consultants. So um, I see lots of different um, companies as well. And um, my take on the current situation is um, that there are the we've only covered the tip of the iceberg when it comes to data science and AI bringing it, bringing it to practice. So lots of medium-sized companies, smaller companies, they're still struggling. And um, not only on the technical side, um, which where we've definitely advanced a lot in the past couple of years, but uh, when it comes to like data literacy and actually 
um, making people understand what they are using and how to interact with AI. And I see that as part of the data scientist role to educate people on data and make make them yeah make them aware that well the the numbers are there to to support them and their decisions and not to like um, yeah. They're not made up anymore because I've seen lots of numbers that have been made up <laughs> on like PowerPoint slides. So um, bringing that data literacy forward, that is one of the biggest challenges, I think, especially because training a model is just one line of code. And um, it's so easy these days and it's so easy, easily misused. So we'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Do you experience? Data. Oh, sorry. No, no, uh, go on. Miriam, do you experience a lot of misconceptions um, working as a consultant with a lot of companies, for example, especially now that ChatGPT, for example, gets so much hype? Um, first of all, I think most of the companies are not bothered by ChatGPT, Chat <laughs> at least not the companies <laughs> that I work with. So this is, mm. I, I also like, um, last weekend, I asked a friend who works in the social uh, sector whether she has heard of ChatGPT, and she looked at me and was like, what? Mm. <laughs> so we are all in this bubble and this is very yeah. huge for us, but for the rest of the world, it's rather small. Um, and but I th think, yes, there is lots of misconception. So even like people who are, who are not used to work with data, they usually struggle with the concept of uncertainty and what a mo model actually is. Mm. And that is, and I find it sometimes rather difficult to explain what is what is possible what are the standard use cases what what can you do um and it's understandably that the business users it's not that is not their bread and butter it's not it's not what they do every day so it's our responsibility to get it like closer to like you always have, need to have that business focus so that they're like oh this could be useful for me and that is always the the main struggle and then you also have the fear that oh these people come to take away my job um also had that a couple of times <laughs> we're just here to help <laughs> this also sounds like ai realism to me what you just talked about definitely just like more said i do love research but in my everyday work it's all the basics <laughs> it's kind of insane to when you meet people that haven't heard of chat gpt because when you're in this uh, circle chat gpt is 99 percent of twitter and linkedin yeah. or it's maybe 100 percent almost so it's it's mm -hmm. kind of insane when you hear about people that haven't heard of it no but, i mean yeah, like, that's true even my friends who are like you know uh not related to any of like you know sciences or computer science or it background they are just like you know writing to me uh, what do you think about chat gpt and it's like you know when when it like actually got the hype uh like maybe a month or two ago and everyone was just like there were so many of my friends that were like do you know about chat gpt it's like uh, how good is it can it like take over the world i was like okay let's let's calm down <laughs> let's chill yes it's oh, not it's the singularity chill. for sure <laughs> yes. yeah I, I see a question in chat, which is, a, uh, which is an article. So I'm going to read the headline and it asks um, any opinion on this. And the title is hella swag or hella bad. 36% of these popular large language model and benchmark contains errors. So if the person has any more specific question mm. about it they can ask it or um, i don't know if you already can express an opinion it's in chat yeah yeah i'm looking at the article uh, right now um maybe the person can say do you already know what kind of errors like what is meant with errors but yeah i mean i can imagine that a lot of these benchmarks contain errors but i can't really say anything about about it without uh, having a um, a deeper look into it. Mm, I just looked at it and there are examples of, for example, straight up um, grammatical errors. So for okay. example, plural being recognized as the single form, for example, and stuff like that. So I think benchmarks are really, really, really important. And there's also this paper called, um, yes, really look at it, but in the end, um, I think that 
with LN, especially with large language models, right? I will post it in chat. Um, this is a great paper also. I mean, also has a lot of criticism on it, but in, in the end, it's called uh, pervasive label errors in test sets destabilize machine learning benchmarks, which basically is the notion of if you have, of course, errors in your test set in benchmarks, then your real world estimation of the performance of your models is completely uh, messed up, basically, which is why it is so important that benchmarks are correct. And especially when it comes to large <laughs> language model benchmarks, I'm not so sure because, um, yeah, I, I today I read a comment on Twitter, which which was, I mean, it, it wasn't really funny, but also a little bit real. It was like um, bench about benchmarking large language models. And then they would say, if the, um, yeah, if we had such a great benchmark on large language models that would give us a comprehensive overview of the capabilities of it, then uh, we would stop querying the large language model and start querying the benchmark. Um, because the benchmark itself has to be so big, basically, because all these capabilities these models have beyond a certain parameter threshold. Um, and I don't think that having like so, so much data is really, really hard to get and also really hard to get right. So I would love to see actually more publications um, in this term, like benchmarking and data collection also, and all these um, stupid hacks that people are finding on Twitter, like the Valuigi effect and, and stuff like that. So there's, I think there's really a market for it right now. And I hope um, I'm not too deep into like the academ academic side of it, but I hope that also people at um, conferences see that this is one of the large problems that needs to be solved, how to actually interpret these things. Really cool answer. Um, I, I think if people don't have any more questions, we could possibly end it here. Let's just see if somebody comes with um, something else. But if not, I'm for sure wanna thank you so much for coming, taking your time and presenting your work. Um, also, the um, after presentation chat was really pleasant. So thank you about that. And um, keep posting uh, memes and non-memes in our Discord. Um, we appreciate it. <laughs> um, also, thank you, Miriam, for um, active participation. And thanks, everybody, for coming, listening, talking, chatting. Um, check our, our uh, events. Um, we have two live events coming and then three non-live events and also a lot more in April. So thank you all. Thanks for, Thanks having, for having us. us. Thanks a lot. It was really cool talking to you. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye-bye. <laughs>